Hello, I'm Hannah McGlynn. Hello. Um, today I'm going to be talking about two projects that I've worked in organising. Um, one is looking at the physical aspect of actually engaging with archaeology in a hands-on way. And one is looking at utilising technology such as virtual reality. They both have the same goal, they just approach from different directions. <coughs> so the first one is the Edinburgh Archaeology Outreach Project. This is a project that I created in my fourth year of university um, at Edinburgh, uh, and it kind of stemmed as a consequence of my frustration at the inequalities and opportunities. I saw a lot of people that were in my class who went to schools that gave them amazing, amazing opportunities to learn about archaeology, and they were walking into this with a foundation already to set for them. They had a foundation-based knowledge that I did not have because I did not have those opportunities in my school. And I was annoyed. <laughs> and so I decided that this could be changed and the best people to do it were students because we don't like to admit it, but we do have a lot of spare time. <laughs> <laughs> so the goals are very simple. The goals are to um, open the door to young people from ages five to 17 to introduce them to archaeology where they may not have felt it was an area they could go into before. <coughs> uh, we wanted to hopefully, as a result of our visits, for them to go away with an interest in heritage and further pursuing some knowledge in that in some way. And to also create the opportunities to learn, uh, not only for the students but for the volunteers to go in as well. The visits are for everyone. They're for schools, they're for community groups, <coughs> they are for the young ones, the old ones, everyone in between. Our volunteers are everyone. From first year through to PhD, from recent graduates, to someone who has an interest in it who wants to be involved. The whole point of the visits is that no one is uh, discriminated against based upon their social or economic status, their age, their sex, their nationality, their nothing should tender you from being able to learn about your heritage of your local community. The structure of our visits are very simple. Um, it's been mentioned before that hands-on heritage is the way to go forward, and it's very true. Uh, a lot of psychologists recommend that 20 minutes maximum is about the most that five to 12-year-olds can focus on at the one time. So we usually take the form of a short, very short presentation on what archaeology is, because if you try and talk to seven-year-olds about what archaeology is for 45 minutes, uh, you'll probably have a couple of corpses on the ground by the end. <laughs> so, 10 minute presentation, what is archaeology? Basics, cover it, done, move on. We set up stations, and each of those stations has a different topic and a different thing for them to do. They can vary from um, pottery making, coil pottery making at one table, then you can progress on to looking at animal bones. And how do you differentiate these? What do you think this could be? Why do you think that could be? Then we can move on to things such as cave painting. And there's just an endless amount of options. And of course, the never ending, never disappearing sand pit, um, which I think I've lost many replica artifacts to along the way. I also had one school steal my uh, trowel. I think it might be in Sheen's primary, I'm not sure. But. <coughs> so the benefit of that is that it they are able to have the physical interaction with the objects that they're dealing with. They can handle things, they can touch things, and in the case of the animal bones, for some reason, they also want to lick them. <laughs> um, it's never been my first reaction when picking up a sheep skull, is to lick it. But apparently, age range seven to nine, that's their first go-to, so you know, pay attention to that one. Um, so as it stands, our main group age is about seven to ten years old. We've done older, we've done younger. The youngest was a nursery in Fife. They were four years old. I think they were just happy to get to move around more for the day and have new things to touch. Uh, right they were up to scouts groups at 17 years old. These are a couple of the visits we've been on. We're lucky in that the initial contact I made, which involved just sitting down for a day and emailing everyone in Edinburgh, we've had a reputation that's built that we've not had to recontact anyone for visits. Uh, our reputations followed us and we've been able to just, through word of mouth, have people contact us to go to their schools for visits. <coughs> uh, some current numbers that we have, the project's been running since 2013, so we're in our fourth year now. We currently have um, about 175 members, 
over 100 of them, I think about 103 or 104, are active volunteers who've been out on visits with us, uh, on be it one or 20 occasions. Uh, we have been on over 100 visits and visited round about, it's probably sitting at about 2,000 young people <coughs> across um, Edinburgh, Lothians and Fife, uh, ranging in age from uh, the 13 to the 17. We always get feedback from our visits as a way to promote ourselves on our website, but also as a way for us to look at what we need to improve upon and where we can go with this. Um, we've been very lucky in that most of them have been incredibly positive and we've had very little negative uh, feedback from them. The positive aspects of utilising this way of engaging with young people in heritage is that they do have the ability to only focus on things for short periods of time and short bus, uh, bursts and contain their focus to these items. So you do manage to, to hold their attention and truly make them learn something without boring them to death. Um, they get to interact with items. They may be replicas, they may be real, but they get to touch them and feel them, and we take it to them. There's no burden on them to come to us. We take it to the schools, to their community group, for no fee and no price at theirs. So everyone is able to enjoy it. We don't actually know if we've achieved our goals. I'd like to think we have. Uh, but actual concise, detailed research as to whether or not we've done that hasn't been done yet. It could be the next stage. Um, we really want to know, you know, are they more interested in their heritage and archaeology as a result of being introduced to it where they might not have before? And we can maybe progress through collaborations and uh, educational research taking into to consideration those. The second project is looking at the, <coughs> the virtual. We have two projects that have been developed as part of the Academic Beaker Video Project. Um, they came about as a result of a bottle of wine, um, as most probably do. Um, we, uh, I was speaking to my friend who works for Samsung doing virtual reality outreach. And at this point, Maya had asked me, after my experience of working and developing the Edinburgh Archaeology Outreach Project, to get involved in community engagement. And it was speaking to my friend Diego, who just got this job with Samsung. He didn't know how on earth he was going to try and engage the public in virtual reality. I had no idea how I was going to engage people in Bronze Age Scotland and we kind of realised that this could work for us. We went on to speak to the informatics department at the University of Edinburgh. We were able to develop a NSC final project, which was to basically create a virtual reality game experience to teach people about archaeology in a way that was innovative and engaging and was on their level of technological capabilities. One of the projects was a game called Finding Ava. It's a detective-based game. So you have to go through several stages to complete the task. It's supposed to teach you about the process of excavation, but also have the detective game fun uh, aspect to it as well. So. And the second one is Ava. This one was a sort of side project that kind of came to be from nothing. Um, anyone who knows Maya knows that she has a pile of work at any given time taller than herself. Um, but she is that enthusiastic and that passionate about this project, she couldn't help but pass, she couldn't pass on the opportunity, sorry, to create something else. And this is a, all based on her illustrations, and the, this is an interpretation of Bronze Age Scotland and a journey through it. And all the plant life are based upon research of the actual plant life and such that would have been there at that time. So this was a collaborative project between University of Edinburgh, the School of Informatics, and the Academic Baker Burial Project and Samsung Internet. We were lucky enough to have developers come up from London to help the MSc students uh, turn their idea into a uh, reality. The reason why we thought that this could be a perfect way to approach engaging young people in heritage was for many aspects, such as five to 15 year olds spend 15 hours a week online and video game players, the, the utilisation of gamification in heritage. 29% of video <coughs> game players in the US are 18 years old, and I don't doubt that that's probably the same worldwide. And this one was particularly interesting for me. The 41% of 5 to 15 year olds have their own smartphone. The interesting use of Samsung and Samsung Internet in the uh, collaboration project was that they utilised smartphones and the internet to make this happen. So you can use the cardboard VR headset, you could be out anywhere you wish. You could be sitting in the pub with your friends, stick your phone in, and you can be playing a VR game learning about archaeological heritage. There's no limitations with technology in such that way. It's accessible to everyone. 
Now, the project created two experiences. Um, about 200 users have been tested. We trialled it at the National Museum of Scotland and then showcased it at Explorathon 2017, which was won by Dig It at the National Museum of Scotland. In total, it was about 12 months from bottle of wine idea to Explorathon. Um, so it happened very quickly, but the feedback that we've got from the museum has allowed us to develop, uh, going forward into this year, another master's project with the university. And so we can build upon what's already been done to make it fine-tuned to exactly what the community and the public who are engaged with it so far tell us that they think it could be made better by doing X, Y, Z. Well, going forward, we'll make X, Y, Z happen. Some feedback that we got at the National Museum from... Uh, a nice six-year-old boy who must have been using it for about 20 minutes by this point. Um, most of them were along the lines of could have more unicorns, um, needs more pink, um, should have a giraffe, and then there was other ones which were maybe more realistic, which were to have multiple people interacting in the environment at the same time. Um, but I prefer this one. So this is Finding Ava, the game-based um, experience. You have different levels to go through. So you do the initial excavation, you undertake the research, and then you draw your final conclusions from what it is you've experienced. And all the information you begin able to pull together. So it's testing them on their abilities to uh, collate information and the interpretations they make as a result of that. And the important thing is we tell them there is no, at the end game, there is no wrong answer. It's all about how they interact with what they find, how they interpret it, and if they can justify their conclusions, if they say that Ava is a seven foot tall man and she eats fish, oh, okay, why do you believe that? We want them to, to think critically and challenge them on that aspect. So the reviews are that this is uh, using sort of gamification sense. It's something that we can connect to their positive experiences, their hobbies, their, the things they enjoy are playing games. Uh, using smartphones, all those sorts of things that they enjoy, we can use to relate this to and hope it, hope, hopefully um, have that positive correlation. It engages them because it's something they're interested in, something they're used to. This is a generation, they're the, the digital generation. They are born into this. It's not something that's new to them. They're having to learn it like I do. Um, it's, it's a comfortable environment for them. And going forward, we, we want to measure the impact of this. In what way are we impacting their interest in heritage and engagement? Are young people more likely to be involved in their heritage and environment as a result of using this sort of technology? And how far can we, can we push that? It's a never-ending and only ever-evolving um, area, technological advancement. So it's a case of how far can archaeology go in it rather than how far can the technology go? And I think through collaborations and, and dissemination through be it through schools, be it through organisation and teaming up with other projects. How far can we take this? Um, and I think that's the good way to progress as well. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, I would like to say a special thank you to all the volunteers at the Edinburgh Archaeology Outreach Project. I think some of them have been helping today, um, videotape and guide people and things, I think. Um, specifically to Maya Hull, who can't be here today, unfortunately, uh, Diego Gonzalez and from Samsung, uh, Jean Jun Liu, who created the Finding Ava game, uh, Dr. Cartex, who's at the University of Edinburgh, and Josie Wallace, who is also someone who's utilised the uh, realm of the digital heritage and archaeology. And she's created an augmented reality osteological archaeology experience uh, to <coughs> educate people about the osteological profiles of the skeleton from the site of Akhenan Beaker Burial Project. Uh, this experience, uh, Josie's experience, as well as both of the games we are showcasing in the foyer food area, that one, um, so feel free to come on.